Hello, uh, we're going to look at glomerular diseases here. So I know that it's a rather confusing topic, so we're going to just be very systematic about it and start by looking at glomerular function, just as it was presented to you in your lecture notes. Then we will correlate the glomerular function with the main clinical presentations of glomerular diseases. There are five main clinical presentations. We will look at them one by one, and then for each clinical presentation, we will look at the specific glomerular disease that is associated with that. And finally, we will just correlate this with the morphology, meaning what do we actually see on the histology picture. And when I say this, I only mean whether it is a proliferative picture or a non-proliferative picture. Before we start on the mind map, I just want to familiarize you with some of the terms that you're going to be hearing. Now, when we talk about glomerular diseases, we have the primary glomerulopathies, and then we have the systemic diseases with glomerular involvement that are not just primarily hitting the glomeruli. And then we have hereditary disorders. So for primary glomerulopathies, um, you're going to be hearing about acute proliferative glomerulonephritis, especially the post-infectious ones. This usually occurs post-streptococcal infection. Rapidly progressive or crescentic glomerulonephritis. Membranous glomerulopathy. Minimal change disease focal segmental glomerulosclerosis and membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis and also IgA nephropathy and then a chronic glomerulonephritis are uh, actually a mixed bag or a spectrum of conditions. So I know these names are all very new but you will be hearing them um, several times later on. So some of these will have on histology a proliferative pattern, some will not and we'll go through these cases. Now, um, there are also, of course, systemic diseases which can affect the glomerulus and a very important example would be systemic lupus erythematosus, also diabetes. Diabetes is interesting because um, it not only affects the glomerulus, remember we talked about the kidney in terms of the components, it also affects the tubules and the vessels. And similarly, amyloidosis affects the glomeruli as well as the vessels. And then we have other conditions like good pasture syndrome, which is anti-glomerular um, basement membrane disease. And we have conditions with a vasculitic component and even bacterial endocarditis. Now let's start our mind map. So um, the first thing that we want to look at is really the functions of the glomerulus, or rather the function, because uh, what it is, is a filter. So of course, there are actually only two things that can go wrong when it, you're looking at a filter. It can either leak, let things through that it's not supposed to, or it can stop filtering, meaning that it basically does not let anything through. And this is something that was uh, mentioned in your lecture. So here we've got the clinical presentation, and here we have got the main histologic pattern, meaning whether it's proliferative or not. So um, one of the important clinical presentations is nephrotic syndrome. So there are actually five components of, uh, of nephrotic syndrome, and this includes proteinuria. There is a numerical uh, level, it's uh, 3.5 grams of protein loss per 24 hours. And there is accompanying hypoalbuminemia. There is also generalized edema or anasaka, basically due to the uh, decreased serum oncotic pressure because of the low albumin levels. So all this makes uh, sense, you can actually work it out. And then there's also concomitant lipidurea as well as hyperlipidemia. So in nephrotic syndrome, the commonest cause is actually minimal change disease and this is often seen in children. Another cause would be membranous uh, glomerulonephropathy. Um, these have been mentioned just very briefly just now in the primary glomerular diseases. And another cause is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Uh, yet another cause is membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. And um, if we want to see whether on histology these are proliferative, interestingly for nephrotic syndrome, most of the causes are non-proliferative glomerulonephropathies. So we can see here that three of these conditions are non-proliferative whereas one of them, membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, as the name suggests, is proliferative and we would see increased cellularity in the glomerulus. Now, the second clinical syndrome, and uh, this has to do with leaky um, glomeruli, similar to nephrotic syndrome, 
is that of hematuria. Now, this may or may not be accompanied by proteinuria. So nephrotic syndrome and hematuria are both due to leaky filters. So this is often seen in IgA nephropathy. I will leave you to actually read out on the specific um, entities yourselves. So IgA nephropathy is a proliferative uh, glomerular nephropathy. And as I said, it's, this may be accompanied by proteinuria. The next clinical syndrome is nephritic syndrome, not to be confused with nephrotic syndrome. So this is spelt with an I. And um, this is due to actually uh, both a leaky filter as well as uh, poor filtration. So let's take it one by one. If there is a leaky filter, there will be things that are not supposed to go through but will be filtered through into the urine. And this includes uh, red blood cells and protein. So there is both hematuria as well as proteinuria. And now when the filter is poor and it does not filter as well as it's supposed to, meaning that it lets less fluid through, there is resulting oliguria. There is raised um, serum creatinine level, also known as azotemia. And there is fluid retention, which leads to edema as well as hypertension. And just to repeat, it is a combination of leakiness as well as um, the poor function of the filter. Now, um, one of the most important uh, causes uh, is post-infectious glomerulonephritis. This is also known as acute proliferative glomerulonephritis. And as the name suggests, it is a proliferative picture on histology. Another cause would be membranoproliferative uh, glomerulonephritis. And you can see here, membranoproliferative MPGN can cause either nephrotic syndrome or nephritic syndrome. Now, number four is rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. This is also known as crescentic glomerulonephritis because of the histologic pattern. The crescents are something that we see as a cellular proliferation of cells near Bowman's capsule in the glomeruli, and this is due to poor filtra uh, filtering function. So rapidly progressive uh, GN uh, can be seen in good pasture syndrome. Uh, this is actually considered to be a secondary glomerular disease because it is a systemic disease and there is antibodies against glomerular basement membrane. Uh, it can also be seen in a vasculitic condition with anti-neutrophil antibodies, ANCA. And these neutrophils can be located in the glomeruli, so the antibodies actually latch onto the neutrophils in the glomeruli. Now, these are both proliferative uh, conditions. Before we move on, let's just take a minute to define what we mean by rapidly progressive GN. So essentially, there is anuria, meaning that there's no urine at all, uh, no urine output, or severe oliguria, and this is accompanied by increased serum creatinine. And the rapid part is defined by a progression uh, in up to three months, meaning three months or less. And this is actually essentially um, the definition for acute renal failure as well. Uh, there is actually one more condition which I forgot to add in here. Post-infectious glomerulonephritis can also give rise to a pattern of rapidly progressive GN. Now, um, the last clinical syndrome uh, is chronic renal failure. And it makes sense because uh, it's easier to remember if you think of this as acute renal failure. So there's acute renal failure and there's chronic renal failure. And this again is due to um, the poor function of the filter itself. Um, and chronic renal failure can be caused by any of the glomerulonephritis that are mentioned here. So I'm just going to scribble down a few for you to see. And these include uh, membranous glomerulonephropathy, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, post-infectious or post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, and IgA nephropathy. Uh, also, just to mention that the good pasture syndrome and these anchor-related vasculitis are considered secondary glomerular diseases. They're not under the list of primary glomerular diseases. Uh, now, there are some points to note, and uh, do take note that some conditions may give rise to both nephrotic as well as nephritic syndromes. They are not exclusive. And some examples include systemic conditions like uh, SLE as well as systemic vasculitis, um, and also membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, which um, I have already showed here. 
Now, what are some of the mechanisms, very quickly, of this immune-mediated injury? So it is interesting that glomerular diseases are usually uh, immune-mediated conditions and is due to antibodies uh, usually attacking uh, antigens either in the blood or in uh, the glomerulus itself. So there are three types of um, antibody-antigen reactions, uh, and um, one of them is where the antibody binds to the in situ antigen in the glomerulus. So the antigen can either be there originally or it can be planted there by an infectious uh, agent, for example. So there is good pasture syndrome. This is when there is a uh, gl uh, glomerular basement membrane itself is the antigen. Hepatitis B is an example of a planted antigen. The immune complexes, the antibody antigen uh, complexes can actually be circulating already within the blood and then they get trapped in the glomeruli. And an example would be post-infectious glomerulonephritis as well as uh, SLE. And the third mechanism can be when the antibody um, binds to cellular antigens that are in the glomerulus. For example, uh, the anti-neutrophil antibodies, ANCA, seen in a systemic vasculitis. So moving on, I just want to quickly show you a pictorial view of the non-proliferative versus a proliferative glomerulo uh, glomerulonephropathy. This is an example of minimal change glomerulonephropathy or minimal change disease where you really don't see any significant increase in cells or any really uh, appreciable abnormality under light microscopy. And this is one of the non-proliferative glomerulopathies. Now, this is an example of a post-infectious glomerulonephropathy or post-streptococcal. And you can see that there are a lot of uh, inflammatory cells and it's just very cellular in the glomerulus as compared to this non-proliferative condition. Another type of proliferative glomerulopathy is chrysanthic glomerulonephritis. And uh, here we're actually looking at a crescent. You can see that there is a crescent uh, shaped proliferation of cells right at the edge of the capillary tufts and filling up Bowman space. And um, this is the picture that we see in RPGN. As, as mentioned, uh, there are several causes that uh, we talked about earlier on. Usually once crescents are visible, uh, if this is not treated immediately, then these patients may actually progress to uh, renal failure. Um, so here we have uh, most of the conditions that are associated with the five main clinical presentations of glomerular diseases. I've only touched on the names of these conditions. Of course, you will need to supplement this with your notes and your textbook to read into individual conditions in terms of pathogenesis and clinical features. Also from this list, you can see that they include primary glomerular diseases as well as some of the secondary or systemic diseases associated with glomerular damage or injury.